let's get started. So our talk is called Tales from On Call, Fun with Operating at CD at Scale. Uh, my name is Geeta, and I will be joined over video by Chao Chen. Uh, both of us work at Amazon Web Services. So let me introduce a little bit about us. Um, we work for EKS. EKS is a managed Kubernetes service. Uh, what that means is EKS manages the control plane for you, all aspects of it, uh, performance, scalability, uh, and availability. So all the components here in the blue rectangle uh, are owned and managed by EKS. Customers don't have access to those. Uh, they typically just manage their workloads and sometimes the worker nodes. So within the control plane, uh, the team I uh, am from is the etcd team, which focuses on operations and uh, contributions to etcd. Now let's hear from Chao about our etcd environment. Uh, thank you, Kita. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Chao, a software engineer at Amazon. I've been actively working uh, in the operation of SCD, the distributed key value store that is used by Kubernetes as its primary data store. In my virtual talk today, I'll be sharing some of some of my experiences and uh, insights of operating SCD in Kubernetes clusters. Now, SCD at EKS. EKS SCD. Uh, each EKS SCD cluster is a three-node cluster, evenly distributed across three availability zones in a region. Um, availability zones are isolated data center uh, re located with specific regions in which public cloud services originate and operate. Uh, the uh, mm, second uh, EKS SCD uses static IP to advertise SCD client what endpoint it should connect to, and for peer communication. We also use static volumes to store wall and DB files. Uh, static here um, means every SCD node will reduce the same IP and volume after the previous node is terminated. It guarantees data durability, even if SCD Chrome is lost permanently. It also indicates the SCD membership is static. Uh, there's no membership reconfiguration, um, simplifies the, oper uh, the operation. EKS SCD supports version downgrade from 3.5 to 3.4. Uh, it's a EKS private patch, and there is a reference published in, uh, in upstream. Um, EKS SCD 3.4, 3.5, and 3.3 does not have storage and API layer schema incompatible issues. Uh, for example, the difference between the 3.3 and the 3.4 raft internal protocol buffer schema change is a uh, list checkpoint request. Uh, if in a 3.4 leader, the experimental list checkpoint feature is enabled, once it starts to replicate the entry to the 3.3 follower, the follower exit server cannot understand the entry schema and, and we just panic during uh, deserialization. Uh, first, uh, EKS SCD uh, runs as a system D daemon service, unlike runs SCD in a container. Uh, we run SCD as a system D uh, service because it's a simpler approach with less overhead involved, like network isolation and container orchest uh, orchestration. Um, fifth. Uh, EKS SCD operator agent uh, runs in the same box as SCD. Uh, in EKS, we run SCD operator agent in the same box as SCD to manage provisioning, health checking, uh, taking periodic backup and storing persistent storage, automatic defrag and, and monitoring, etc. cetera. Uh, no space alarm self-service will be touched, up, uh, touched upon later by Kita. Yep, that's the uh, introduction of SCD at EKS. Um, so now that you guys know who we are, uh, let's get to the agenda. 
So today we want to talk about five operational issues that we see while, we, uh, while operating HCD. The first one is where the storage quota provided by HCD is not enough for the workload. Second one is the revision divergence issue where the nodes don't agree with each other. HCD can run out of memory, that's the third one. Uh, we sometimes see timeouts, uh, mostly related to the maintenance workflows of HCD. Uh, Chao will talk about that. And sometimes we see requests that are too large than the limit uh, HCD runs with. Let's get started. So the first one is the database size quota exceeded. Before I get to the production issue, uh, let's recap a few concepts. So this is a simplified view of HCD layers. We have raft for consensus, and then we have the backend storage, which is bold DB or the DB file, which is a big memory mapped file. The concept of quota applies to the backend. Um, this is a toy example where we show key A, which is shown in pink, and key B, which is shown in green, and those two keys have filled up the file. A1, A2, A3, they represent updates to that key. And A del represents the key getting deleted. Uh, same for B1, B2, B3, they are updates to that key. So things to note here is that when the file fills up, there are multiple revisions per key occupying space in that file. Uh, the other thing to notice is that it's copy on write semantics, so every update to the key takes up a new page in the file. Uh, deletes work the same way, so a deletion will also add to the file. Uh, when the file hits the quota, an alarm is raised, and that needs to be explicitly disarmed. Uh, today, we run with 8 GB quota, which is the maximum supported limit upstream. When the alarm hits, the cluster becomes read-only. Uh, any modify operation, put operation cannot get in. The next concept is that of compaction. Um, so compaction cleans up the old history. So in our toy example here, if we compacted everything that was in that file, only B4 will stay. Everything else will get cleaned up and the files will have free pages or holes, if you will. Under normal circumstances, when there is no alarm, uh, these holes are usable by HCD. But when the alarm has already triggered, the put request will be declined even if there, is, uh, there are holes in the file. In EKS environment, compaction is run by API server every five minutes. The next concept is that of defragmentation, and Chao will talk about this more when we visit the timeouts. But defragmentation basically removes all the holes and packs up the live data into a brand new file. So again, in our toy example, B4 will sit by itself in a brand new file. At this point, the size of the file will drop. Uh, however, like I said, the alarm will not clear by itself unless we call a specific disarm API. All right, so in production, multiple times we see workloads exceeding our 8 GB quota, many times unintentionally. Uh, when this limit is reached, cluster becomes read-only, and your on-call gets paged. The interesting thing is that the compaction as run by Kubernetes API server stops working when this alarm is raised. This is because the compaction workflow from Kubernetes API server needs to do a put request before calling the compact API. And since that put request cannot get in, it never calls the compact API. Uh, the operator wakes up, and then we typically increase the quota, and then it is a coordinated activity. We request the customer to do the deletion of objects before returning the quota back to 8 GB. So why do we see this issue? Uh, there are three main factors, object size, object count, and then multiple revisions due to fast updates. So this is an example uh, from production where we see this last key here, the admission reports, there are two million objects. So even if the object size is just few KBs, this will rack up GBs of space quickly. Uh, we have a blog article out about this, uh, which you can find online. The second example, object size. This is when uh, the workload typically has a big uh, key or a big binary blob in pod spec, such as SSH keys typically. 
uh, because it's part of the part spec, it gets replicated. And the part spec becomes big, like 500K, 800K, those are the bigger ones we have seen. Uh, while this is supported, this is not optimal. And there is an easy way to optimize this by referencing the big blob instead of embedding it uh, in the part spec. So we talk about that in the, in the blog. And the last one is these repeated updates. Uh, we often get questions like, I have just 1,000 parts. How come they are taking up 8 GB of space? So remember that when the quota hits, there are multiple revisions per key. So if something goes through fast updates, it's taking up much more than the size of that object. Consider a 800K part spec, and it goes through 10 updates. It's now taking up 8 MB per pod. So 1,000 of those is going to consume the 8 GB. Uh, typically, we see this together with the large object size. Uh, audit logs can help identify what's changing fast, and we have our CloudWatch query example in our blog. Other providers can also have similar query, um, or on-prem also you can find the query for audit logs. Here is an example of a fast changing objects. Here, uh, the scheduler is updating a pod repeatedly uh, just to record the fact that it's not possible to schedule that pod on any node. So these are unintentional side effects, uh, but they do eat up the quota. This can be monitored for. So for monitoring this proactively, API server has a metric for this. So there could be a monitor on that. Uh, detecting it reactively, it has already happened. Then there is this specific log message that you can look for, uh, which will tell you that database quota is exceeded. Mitigation. So today, as I said, when the DB size approaches the quota, it pages one of our team members who are on call. And they wake up and they do this coordination to get the cluster back into operational mode. Uh, we have some work in progress to automate some of the workflows we do uh, manually today. In long run, we would like to work with the community to enable a self-service experience for this, such as a file system. Stuff fills up, you go and delete. Maybe in case of HCD, you wait a little bit, but then your cluster comes back uh, to read write. We have thought of increasing the quota. We used to run with 4 GB. Now we run with 8 GB. Uh, increasing it any further will need more testing and validation for performance. Uh, we are at the limit uh, supported by upstream. All right, so that's the first issue. Now let's hear from Chao about the revision divergence. Thanks, Gita. Uh, let's uh, go to the next topic, SED revision divergence in a cluster. Um, here is an animation of the revision progress in SED. Uh, we can tell uh, we are watching the, the key for uh, to uh, get notification when the key value pair is changed uh, or updated. Uh, or deleted. You can see uh, whenever we up, uh, update a new version of the a full key value, the revision is, incre uh, is incrementing, and as long as we delete that revision, it's also increasing. So NCD uses this global, atomically growing revision number to keep track of changes to the data stored in key value. Store. When multiple nodes in the SED cluster are making changes to the data simultaneously, it's possible for the revision numbers to slightly diverge and converge to the same revision eventually. However, diverging revisions could also mean that two or more nodes in the SED cluster have made conflicting changes to the data. For example, one node successfully complete the modification while the other node discards or partially commit the modification. In EKS SED, this will cause sustained growing revision divergence across SED nodes. So uh, let's take a look at the real world example. Uh, recap uh, each SED cluster is a three node uh, cluster. Um, the orange line represents the maximum of the revision across three nodes, and the green line represents the minimum of the revision across three nodes. The blue line represents the gap 
or or, or the divergence uh, of of the above two lines. So you can clearly see the divergence grows uh, starting from ten o'clock, uh, like and then indefinitely growing. So we observed this failure symptom and configure in, uh, in uh, our alarm systems and uh, to alert the on-call if the divergence uh, grows for an hour. It helps uh, our team proactively uh, mitigates the data inconsistency problems uh, before customer noted, uh, notice the impact. We also open uh, a uh, as in the future request to demonstrate an example to set up the alert role currently uh, uh, correctly in Prometheus and, and Grafana. Uh, the link is shared below uh, and it's on my to-do list to, to complete it. You may wonder uh, how come the revision diverges, uh, divergence grows? Uh, so, uh, this is the code snippet from API server uh, update the objects. So it's using uh, SED transaction API. Uh, inside that transaction, uh, if the SED servers uh, st uh, st stored uh, prepared key modification is, a, is the same as the requested API servers uh, kept revision number, uh, then it will result into a put request. Uh, otherwise, uh, it result in a get request. So as you can see, if initially uh, the prepared keys modified revision is different with this core pattern from client, the revision divergence will grow. impact to uh, Kubernetes. Uh, the core Kubernetes components were failed to acquire these and stop functioning. Uh, for example, Kube, uh, Kube Scheduler and Kube Controller Manager. Uh, and also many other uh, leadership-based controller will fail to acquire these uh, and stop functioning as well. Um, in other words, uh, deployment scaling and post scale and post scheduling will fail. So uh, the following a screenshot is a uh, error message from the uh, Kube controller manager and and, and Kube scheduler. Next uh, mitigation. Uh, the mitigation can be simple once we detected the the the, the failure mode. Uh, we just remove the revision lagging behind member um, and join a fresh new member to be in sync with other uh, members. So it's an exception to use static volume. Uh, we will basically replace um, the DB. So uh, this is followed by the uh, upstream uh, operation guidance of the uh, encryption. Next, root cause. Uh, the root cause now, can be uh, classified as two category. One is SED MVCC partial commits uh, and followed by uh, SED process panics or um, like CKL, the, the process. Mm, it's well uh, summarized in the upstream data inconsist inconsistency summary and uh, the maintainers uh, did a Tremendous great job to preventing this in current uh, 3.5 release. So, um, if you are interested, we, we should, um, you, know, you, sh you can take a look and uh, contribute in that uh, robustness test framework. The second is a, a little bit unknown uh, about a, a BoDB or a, a, it's called SED backend uh, corruption. Thanks, Joe. So about the uh, revision divergence root cause he mentioned, um, there was a talk by a maintainer, uh, Marek, uh, before me. Uh, if you missed it, please check it out. He goes, uh, he does a deep dive on 
how they found the inconsistencies and now have a robustness uh, framework for testing. All right, uh, the third issue, um, etcd can run out of memory under overload. Uh, this issue cascades because if one node goes boom, the same workload that brought that one down goes to the next one, brings that one down as well. And now we have quorum loss. Uh, typically, our case study suggests that the workload that causes this uh, are large, unpaginated range requests. Typically, the same one, get pods repeatedly. Why do, the, uh, why do we see this issue? So these are typically the unpaginated list requests, like I said. It's basically spiky workload. It spikes too much too fast. Uh, every new request is a new allocation in etcd. etcd will never return any cached answers. And the mechanism to free up that memory, the garbage collection, is asynchronous. So there is a window where etcd can uh, run into memory pressure and can ohm. So we have two mitigations for this. The first one is a change on the API server side. This change, when it sees an unpaginated list request, it paginates it. And it before sending to etcd. So etcd client and server will always see a paginated request. The pagination limit is configurable. Uh, the link to the cap is on the slide. Even if we do this pagination, we could land up with a page that the request can still be spiky and can still cause the issue depending on workload. So we have a second layer of defense on the server side. This is a server side throttler which is implemented as a gRPC interceptor. So it's watching every incoming and outgoing request. If it is not a range request, it doesn't do anything to it. It just simply goes through. If it is a range request, then the throttler will check if the box is under memory pressure by just consulting the resident set size of the process as a percentage of the total box memory. If the memory is under pressure, then the request will be admitted after delay. It will throttle it. So this graph shows uh, the test uh, where you can see the throttling in action. The blue line here is the memory pressure. When it goes past 65%, which is the threshold it's running with, the throttler, which is the orange line, that activates and it starts throttling the requests. This is the same test, except it's trying to show that the throttler and the memory pressure feeds into our scalability system. So in this test, the orange line is still the throttler metric. But the green line is the total system memory. So this box got scaled up from 4 GB to 16 GB because of the throttler signal and the memory pressure. Uh, someone might want to use the same changes we are using. Uh, you may not need it. In case you have total predictable workload, you can always provide for the peak workload. Uh, use a bigger box. Uh, but if you are interested in trying out these changes, please do reach out to us. All right, that brings us to the fourth issue. Let's hear from Chao about the timeouts. Uh, thanks, Kita. Uh, let's go to the fourth topic, timeout, and causing 5xx. One of the top contributors of Kubernetes API Server 5xx is SE Online Defrag. Stop the word. So as you can see from the uh, a diagram, when API Server trying to get an object using key one, uh, if the request uh, hits to a uh, SCD server that is defragging, then the request will enhance until timeout. Uh, what is SED defrag? Um, uh, the following statement uh, will be quoted from SED document website. Uh, the key value store is effectively immutable. Its operation do not update the structure in place, but instead always generate a new updated structure or past the versions of keys are still accessible and watchable after modification. To prevent the data store from growing indefinitely over time, the store may be compacted to discard the oldest versions of data. So you can see that from the DB file, there are multiple revisions uh, for, for a key value pair or just a single version, a single uh, version of key value pair like K2. 
So after we compact revision seven, uh, you can see uh, any key value pair that is deleted, uh, it will be compacted, or any uh, previous version of, uh, of key value pair that is superseded with a new version that will also be compacted and uh, uh, leaves uh, free pages in the in the DB file. Compacting the key uh, the key space key street drops or in information about keys superseded prior to a given key space revision. The space used by these keys can then becomes available for additional writes to the key space. So. Uh, at this point, after compaction, the DB file will not shrink, but the free pages can be uh, reused uh, later. Uh, like if you insert a new key value pair, then the, the free page can be uh, reused. Uh, after compacting key, key, key the, key, the key space, the backend database may exhibit uh, like internal fragmentation. Any internal fragmentation is space that is free to use by the backend, but still consumes storage space. Compacting old re revisions internally fragments STD by leaving gaps in the database, uh, backend database. Fragmented space is available for use by STD, but unavailable to the host of our system. Deleting application data does not reclaim the space on disk. So that's when the defrag uh, come, come into the play after defrag db file size shrinks. So oh, what's the mitigation? It gets adopted um, is reduce the frequency of online defrag to run once every 84, uh, uh, 48 hours for each member and, um, and to reduce the latency of defrag, uh, we advise customers to keep the number of keys in STD small uh, and increase the disk throughput um, on demand if there are a lot of uh, objects or key values. Um, other mitigation it could be uh, defrag offline. If the uh, de what defrag offline means is take down the STD server. Uh, a defrag uh, the DB file, uh, shrinks the file size, and remove all of the unused pages, uh, and then bring back the AC server online. So you could uh, uh, mitigate this if the availability risk is um, accepted. Um, some notes is remember to defrag one member at a time. Uh, Future works. Uh, SE Upstream uh, has some great proposal to graceful uh, defrag SD. Um, well, uh, either from client or from server. First is from server to make defrag concurrent internally and not blocking. Uh, other uh, other uh, from client, if uh, it's a multi node cluster, uh, the SD server can notify the client, I'm going to defrag. Please fill over to uh, other endpoints that is not defragging. All right. Um, that brings us to the last issue, which is request size too large. So SCD has a limit on the request size. The default is 1.5 MB. That's what we run with. But sometimes we see workloads which want to push more data through a request. Uh, why do we see this? Uh, typically, it's a workload issue. So here is an example where a customer was using endpoint objects, and they were updating the service, and it got bigger than 1.5 MB. It turned out to be a known upstream issue, and the solution was to use endpoint slices instead of using endpoints. So mitigation, typically we prefer to stay with the upstream limit for this issue, and we have helped customers uh, change the workloads to match best practices to uh, make this issue go away. All right, um, so to summarize, uh, we talked about five operational issues that we see. 
first one was the database size uh, exceeding. Uh, second one was revision divergence. We talked about the panic due to out of memory. Uh, we talked about timeouts due to defrag. Uh, and we talked about the oversized request. Uh, that's it from us. If you want to share your experiences operating at CD, please reach out to us. We would love to learn. Uh, if you want to contribute to HCD, uh, please check out the contributing guide. HCD maintainers are here, so please check out the booth. Uh, and feel free to reach out to us on Slack. Any questions? Uh, thank you. Uh, maybe you can use the microphone over there. Uh, how much are GitOps controllers causing all these issues? Sorry, can you please repeat? How much are GitOps controllers causing all these issues? GitOps, because they can um, hit a lot on ETCD. Right. So uh, can't put a number on it, but we do see list requests uh, from Argo time to time. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. Have a have a great conference. Thank you.